Good afternoon. On behalf of the Office of Juvenile Justice and Delinquency Prevention, I'd like to welcome you to today's webinar series, Removing Barriers for Youth in the Juvenile Justice System. The title of today's webinar is Reversing the School to Prison Pipeline from Incarceration to Education. This is the second webinar in the series. My name is Linda Rosen, and I'm the Training and Technical Assistance Specialist for the Office of Juvenile Justice and Delinquency Prevention. Today's webinar is an especially important topic, as we all know, it's probably the most accessible way for youth to be able to achieve positive outcomes, including socioeconomic stability in their lives, and that's through education. Today's panelists are Starsha Agu, Research Coordinator for the University of Washington's Division of Public and Behavioral Health and Justice Policy, Simone Gonsolin, Principal Research Analyst, American Institutes for Research, Naomi Packman Kaplan, Academic Program Coordinator for Gateways for Youth, and following this 90-minute webinar, please stay connected to participate in a 30-minute question and answer session with co-editors Paul Kuttner and Monica Ng of the book, Disrupting the School to Prison Pipeline, published by the Harvard Educational Review. They will focus on answering questions about incarcerated youth whose lives have been affected and shaped by the School to Prison Pipeline. Now let's hear from OJJDP's intact center. Michelle Duhart will share with you a few features of Adobe Connect. Michelle? Thank you, Linda. Good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for joining us today. As your host, I would like to take a couple of minutes to discuss a few features of Adobe Connect, which will help you maximize your opportunity to participate in today's webinar. To view the bios and photos of the presentation panel, please access the Word documents, which are available now in the handouts pod of the webinar dashboard. Numerous handouts will be referenced today that are also located there for your resource library. To send a chat message to me, your host, a panelist, or another attendee, see number one below. Click the menu icon in the upper right corner of the chat pod, choose Start Chat With, then select Hosts, Presenters, or specific, specific Attendees. Number two, type your message into the text box, and three, hit Enter or click the message bubble icon to send. For those of you participating in today's webinar as a group, please take a minute and help us count. Go to the chat window and type in the name of the person registered and the total number of additional people in the room with you today. This will help us with our final count. Again, if you're viewing with the larger group, thank you for inviting them, but please type in the name of the person registered and the number of additional people joining you today. There will be several opportunities for Q&A throughout the presentation today. As questions arise, please send them to me, your host, to share with the panelists. During that time, we will take every opportunity to address some of the questions you have posed during the presentation. At the conclusion of today's webinar, you will be provided with a link to take a five-minute online survey about today's presentation. We appreciate your feedback regarding this webinar. This information is used to assist OJDP in future planning and training. You will be able to access the evaluation link on the last slide of the PowerPoint. For those of you participating as a group, when you return to your office, please enter the link on the last slide in your web browser to share your feedback. And finally, this event will be archived at OJJB Training Center at www.intac.org in approximately two weeks. Again, thank you for joining us today. A few objectives for today's webinar, you'll see that there are three. We're going to explore strategies to engage the system-involved youth in culturally relevant, strength-based educational programming. Your first presenter will be speaking a little bit about that and sharing her personal story. We'll also talk about the benefits of bringing higher education into juvenile justice facilities, as well as learn about critical components of quality educational programming in juvenile justice facilities. Your moderator today is Ms. Yasmeen Arrington. Ms. Arrington is quite the dynamic young lady. Can I say, Leno's Leadership Unsung Heroes Award, youth recipient, Curve Model, she's a poet, she's a blogger, she's a motivational speaker, she's also the founder and executive director of scholarships, which you'll be hearing about shortly. She's also a Jack Kent Cook Foundation College Scholar and a student at Elon University in North Carolina. Without any further ado, 
please welcome your moderator for the next hour, Ms. Yasmeen Arrington. Hello, everyone, and I'm so glad you are joining us. Thank you so much, Ms. Michelle, for that lovely introduction. Uh, I am pleased to be here. I'm pleased. Uh, I'm very looking forward to all of the panelists that we have today. Uh, so just to tell you a little bit about my story, I can... Um, so I was born and raised in Washington, D.C. Uh, I'm the child of an incarcerated parent or a, pre a previously incarcerated parent, and I'll talk more about that in a minute. I do have a family history of incarceration, uh, and right, I am in the midst of finals, and after this week, I will officially be a junior at Elon University in North Carolina. I'm majoring in communi strategic communications and history. Um, having a my father was in prison, in and out of prison, most of my younger years throughout my life. And um, so I missed having a male figure in the house, a fatherly figure. My mother and my grandmother, both single women, had to step up and be the breadwinners and be, be everything, essentially, my motivation. And I do not blame my father. I, I, I understand that uh, sometimes people have circumstances, not, not that I'm excusing anyone or justifying, but people have circumstances that sometimes cause them to act certain ways and do certain things. And my father just had a troubled life and he was born out of rape. My, my grandmother, his mother was raped and so he was conceived out of rape. And I think that has a lot to do with it. But fortunately, my father and I now, we have a stable, we have a relationship. Uh, while he was still in prison, I was about 16 or 17. When my, my mother passed away my freshman year of high school, my father called the house number, and uh, which my grandmother's had for years, and we just started talking. And um, I told him I've, for, I've forgiven him, and he didn't believe that for a really long time. But I... All in all, to sum it up, I do understand the financial difficulties that having an incarcerated parent or even older sibling can have, and also emotional, uh, emotional effects for children. Ms. Michelle, you can go to the next slide. Oh, oh, I see. <laughs> so here are, you know, you we can talk about our personal stories all day, but I know that people, a lot of folks, you know, we need the, the hard evidence. We need the statistics in order to, uh, you know, prove to corporations and people that it's an important issue and that there is, an there is a prison industrial complex. And this is a very complex issue. Uh, so, for, so here are some of the uh, statistics I found in my earlier research, the U.S. represents 5% of the world po world's population, but we represent 55% of the world's incarcerated. That is an extremely high rate. No one, see, anyone seeing that statistic alone should be very disturbed by that. More than one in every 100 adults in America are in jail or prison. Uh, that was a 2008 statistic by the Pew Char Charitable Trust. And between 1995 and 2005, the number of incarcerated women in the U.S. increased by 57%. Uh, for, for my input, why do I think that it is important to educate our incarcerated youth? They're still young. And a lot of times this group is marginalized and they're forgotten about or their thought that, oh, they will never succeed, they'll never achieve, you know, they don't, they don't want to reach a higher level of education, they don't want to move out of their situation, they're using it as an excuse, and, and that is a very dangerous generalization to make. I'm a young person, and if I was not given a second chance, I would not be where I am today, I would not be at Elon University, private accredited communication school, and so forth. Uh, we forget to consider their family circumstances, as I said before. Um, people, life happens. Sometimes people have financial setbacks. 
uh, and, and family issues that we can't even fathom. Uh, and then providing incarcerated youth and in education can potentially change their lives. So yeah, maybe a child did start off really troubled and they, they, like, they stirred up a lot of um, you know, trouble within their communities and now they're in juvenile detention center. However, if we open up that door and, have, and continue uh, education, I know a lot of private, private prisons are now you know, cutting off their, their, their education. I, I recently met a professor who taught Spanish at a juvenile detention center for quite some years. And it's important to definitely keep uh, those classes open because that can definitely change a young person's perspective and change their life. Uh, so more about scholar CHIPS, CHIPS, C-H-I-P-S, is an acronym for Children of Incarcerated Parents. I began it in 2010 uh, with a $1,000 seed grant from Youth Venture uh, and underneath of Learn, Serve International, which is a nonprofit in Washington, D.C. And what we do is we award scholarships for high school graduates attending college. And some of the requirements uh, the minimum requirement is a GPA of 2.0. When I was applying for scholarships, most of, most the minimum is a 3.0, maybe 3.2 or even a 3.5. Uh, and for scholarships, it's a different type of scholarship. It's for a disadvantaged group. So I considered, I took in consideration that some of these students may not be reaching that 3.0 goal, but that is okay. If they want to go to college, I don't think we should automatically shut that door because they haven't reached the 3.0 mark um, because that has the potential to change. Um, right now, the scholarship, we are providing them or offering them in D.C., Maryland, and Virginia. However, I am in school in North Carolina. I see quite a few of people uh, are in North Carolina currently so I encourage you to reach out to me and, and hopefully we'll expand our scope pretty soon. The application period is just like any other scholarship uh, for high school graduates going to college. It starts in, at the end of the year, like October, November, December, and then it goes till February. And if we see that people need more time, we'll extend the deadline to March. Uh, our track record in June 2012, last year, we awarded eight scholarships for a total of $11,000. Um, four of those were $2,500 a piece. We awarded half in the spring and half in the fall, and four book awards for $250. And currently, we're in that process of evaluating applications to award scholarships this June in 2013. Um, for more information, I encourage you, please visit uh, for more statistics and information about uh, the scholars that we have now, I mean, they're all phenomenal young people. Uh, they motivate me uh, at scholarshipsfund at gmail.com. And we have a Twitter at scholarships um, and a Facebook, www.facebook.com slash scholarships. And I thank you for your time. Now, I will present to you the wonderful Ms. Starcia Agu, and she is a research coordinator for the University of Washington's Division of Public Behavioral Health and Justice Policy. She has much personal experience with child abuse, poverty, child welfare, and the juvenile justice system that gives her a plethora of knowledge on this subject. So with that said, I will let Starshia tell you more about her background and what she does. Thank you, Yasmin, and thank you all 199 folks who were able to join us today. Um, good afternoon, everyone. If you had told me when I was six years old and living in homeless shelter after homeless shelter, or when I was 12 years old and living in a meth lab, or when I was 15 and standing before a judge facing felony charges of robbery and kidnapping, or when I was 20 and fighting the system to get the education I knew would be my only hope for a decent life. If you had told me then that I would one day get up in front of all these people and describe my life as a success story, well, I guess just saying that's plain crazy doesn't quite go far enough. 
Impossible? That's closer. But here I am. And I'm proud to say that I am a success, even though I know I have a whole lot more I need to accomplish. When I was growing up outside of Olympia in western Washington living with my mom, we never really had a place of our own. We'd live in different homeless shelters until my mother got mad and broke the rules and they'd kick us out. Then we'd stay in our car or try to find friends to crash with. I'm the oldest of four kids. All of us have different fathers, which isn't surprising when you know that my mother would sell her body to make money or get drugs. She'd always choose the most abusive men she could find, and she never cared if they hit her or her kids. Moving around so much, I went to a lot of different elementary schools. I wind up with head lice so often that I'd miss out on months of school. My mother just wouldn't take care of it, and they wouldn't let me back in school with their no-knit policy. One time, I'd missed out on so much school that the nurse and principal came to where we were staying and asked if they could treat me. All that did was make my mom angry at me. Her anger was pretty constant. I'd call Child Protective Services or get a principal or teacher to call. It didn't seem like anyone really cared, though. They'd come and do a report, and my mother would just fool them. She was so system savvy, she knew just what to say. All the tricks in the book to cheat on urine tests for drug use and exactly how to scare her kids into staying quiet. I had a cousin who told on her father for abusing her, and they sent her to foster care, where she was raped and abused even more. She begged to come back home, but the family wouldn't have anything to do with her. That became the lesson that my mother would hold up to me. See what happens if you tell? We were taught not to trust authority, and if I did, my mother would beat me for it. She finally got so mad at me and kicked me out at the age of 11. She said that I was a burden and I caused way too many problems. I didn't know where to go or what to do. My father wasn't really in my life, except when he came to give my mother drugs in exchange for sex. My mother made sure that, that, he didn't, that I knew that he didn't care about me and that he didn't love me. But when you're 11 years old, even a dad who doesn't care is a better option than living on the street. So I asked my cousins and uncles and managed to find out where he was living, which was in a meth lab near Olympia. I hate to say it, but living with a big-time drug dealer gave me a much better life than I had with my mom. We lived in a mobile home instead of a homeless shelter. There was always food in the refrigerator. I had money for school clothes and school supplies. I thought it was great. I slept on the couch in the living room, and there were always people coming in and out of the house to buy drugs. I thought that if, I, if they wanted to see my dad bad enough, then they'd pay for it, so I started charging them at the door. This was my first attempt at a college fund. You see, I'd finally realized that my life wasn't exactly normal, and I knew even then that education was a way out for me. When I went over to my friend's house, they'd all sit down and say grace and have dinner together, and I'd eat by myself while my dad made drugs in the shack next door. My friend's families would talk and laugh and do family activities together. My role in my family was to let people in and out of the house at 2 a.m. They lived in big houses in neighborhoods near the schools, and I lived off county property, would beware of dog signs and locks on the gates. For the first time, I saw something I wanted to have, and I knew that I had to stay in school to get it. You see, most of the kids who go into the juvenile justice system are like me, way, way behind in their academic studies. The system focuses on helping them get caught up or earn their GEDs or high school diplomas. College? Well, that just wasn't going to happen, at least not for me. But I refused to give up. I found another kid in JJRA who was intelligent and not nearly in as much trouble as I had been. And he wanted to take college classes, too. I knew that if he could get started, then I'd have a chance. Once he got the OK, I turned to some of the adults who were actually in my corner to write letters of recommendation. Finally, when JJRA said that they'd give me a chance to take Sociology 101, but I had to make an A if I wanted to get beyond that one course. Well, not only did I make an A, I got a letter from the instructor saying it was the best term paper that he had ever read in the past 30 years, and he loved that we, I turned from victim to victor. But again, um, but I was transferred to Echo Glen, another facility, and the fight started all over again. This time, I got the J JJRA's legal service provider um, for residents involved and made it happen there, too. I continued to be able to take college classes one at a time, using all of the funds that I saved over the years with my dollar-an-hour jobs. Slowly, I was getting an education. I spent from the time I was 15 until I was 21 locked up. I had a third grade reading level and fifth grade math level at the age of 15. 
With a little less than a year left, I was released to a group home in Spokane where I went to community college and I worked at Lowe's in the garden department. After less than a month of being, um, being out in August 2008, I was transferred to Washington State University to get my degree in criminal justice. My long-term goal was to get a job working with youth to help them push their voices further than they can and to help be a catalyst for system change. I thought that if I could educate the community and politicians by disseminating the research along with the personal stories of the system-involved youth, more people would care about us and our future. In 2009, Governor Greg Wire recognized me with the Governor Spirit of Youth Award, which is given to juvenile offenders who excelled despite their past mistakes. Later that year, she appointed me to serve on the Washington State Partnership Council on Juvenile Justice, our state advisory board, which advocates for innovative juvenile justice reforms and best practices to improve the system. I've worked at the University of Washington with the Division of Public Behavior Health and Justice Policy since January 2010. Today, I'm the only juvenile in the history of Washington to receive a pardon from the governor. This is my dream come true. As co-chair of the Washington State um, Partnership Council on Juvenile Justice Youth Committee with Assistant Secretary John Clayton, we've made listening to the youth we served a very high priority. We have developed and are piloting United Youth Councils at each JJRA facility. It's sort of like a student government, but for our kids who are locked up. It's a program designed to train youth in community organizing and advocacy, and it's particularly helpful for, ju for justice-involved youth whose social and political stat status is marginalized and who are often the most isolated and discriminated against. Engaging youth enables them to obtain important skills, including critical thinking, decision making, consensus, and team building. For disfranchised and justice involved youth, coordinated events, structured activities, and service learning opportunities offer them a place to build community in a pro-social way to fight for justice. These youth voice experiences at the local and statewide levels provide youth with leadership, public speaking, problem-solving opportunities and skills that will help them grow and develop as emerging adults. Adopting a positive youth development approach with young people requires training, thoughtful planning that lead to an ultimate payoff, helping youth reach successful adulthood and improving systems that impact youth. In response to the President's 2020 goal, which is America will once again have the highest proportion of college graduates in the world the U.S. Department of Education is taking action to reduce the rate of youth and adults entering the criminal, criminal justice system by improving the quality and access to educational opportunities for youth within correctional institutions and improve opportunities for youth exiting correctional institutions successfully. I was one of several youth who were asked to speak about our experiences with Assistant Secretary Messer and Arnie Duncan. I gladly said yes. And wanted to, but wanted to take it a step further and ask them if they would be interested in hearing from the youth in our facilities. My goal was to get at least 50 youth to answer these questions. But we got 70, 74 youth to respond. Some of these questions were, have you and are you able to access educational program in the correctional facility? Would you describe those programs as being high quality, and how could they be better? What educational programming would most help you to reach your personal goals? What are your experiences with your teachers? Do you feel prepared? And what could your teachers have done better? Um, from the 74 responses, um, the responses were mixed in their form and substance. Some youth gave one-word answers in response while others wrote paragraphs detailing their experiences. Particular themes emerged again and again, including desire for college classes and credits, desire for vocational classes, cultivating job prep preparation, and uh, anxiety about the imminent post-detention transition back into high school, college, or the job market. Based on the survey responses, the following next steps would improve the quality and access 
to incarcerated youth to create more opportunities for the successful reintegration into society upon their release. Um, increased use of technology to offer more individualized curriculum that moves the pace of the student to ensure that no student is repeating um, stuff that they've already done before. Increased access to college courses in collaboration with local colleges to ensure that students are working towards uh, credits for their degrees. Increased access and emphasis on vocational and life skills classes to get students ready for their successful transition out of detention or lockup facility. Increased support for teachers to address, to address classroom management issues and free up teachers for lesson instruction and more one-on-one -on -one tutoring. I also wanted to share with you my recent visit to the Harvard Graduate School of Education to speak on a panel about my publication in the Harvard Educational Review Journal um, in regards to transformative justice. You'll hear more, you will hear more about the conclusion, uh, you'll hear, excuse me, you will hear more um, about the Harvard Educational Review at the conclusion of our webinar by Paul Kuttner and Monica Ng. There are thousands of success stories waiting to happen this very minute. Thousands of youth in the juvenile justice system waiting for support. I'm never going to stop fighting for them, and I hope that you won't ever stop either. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you so much, Starcia. You have an extremely powerful story. Uh, next, we have Naomi Talkman Kaplan. She is the Academic Program Coordinator for Gateways of Youth. Naomi graduated with her BA from Evergreen State College in 2011. She is a co-coordinator of Gateways for Incarcerated Youth and Facilities and facilitates the Academic Mentoring Program at Green Hill. Without further ado, I will welcome Naomi to the floor. Hello, everybody. Thank you so much for taking the time out of your day to be here. My name is Naomi Teichman Kaplan, and as was said, I am the Academic Mentor Program Coordinator for Gateways for Incarcerated Youth. And I learned through my own trauma history that good people did bad things. And I found Gateways when I was 16 years old. I was in my second high school. And it was a school that catered to what society deemed were primarily high-risk youth, many for whom incarceration just was a rite of passage. And that school got shut down my junior year due to lack of funding. I was ready to drop out, give up, didn't have a plan, but education wasn't it. But I was really, really fortunate because I had two parents for whom education was monumentally important. My dad was a father of teachers, and my mom, who came to America when she was 12, was the first person in her family to graduate high school and college. So they begged and pleaded with me to visit the school called Evergreen. And reluctantly, I went with them, and it just happened to be the day where the faculty presenter was Tony Zaragoza who was the college class faculty for Gateways at the time. And hearing him talk about Gateways and the level of passion and care and respect for these young people that he worked with made me want to be part of that community. I wanted to be in a place that cared about people like me and the people that I loved. And so I decided to finish up high school, school number three, and made my way to Evergreen. And I ended up being able to graduate in three years and was able to jump directly into a coordinator position after that. So Gateways for Incarcerated Youth Sorry, let me wait for my slide to go back. Gateways for Incarcerated Youth was established in 1996 by Dr. Carol Minhu, who was the founder of the Evergreen State College Tribal Program. She got a call from Maple Lane 
saying that there was a lot of violence between the native and Chicano youth, and they asked her to come and talk to them. And she didn't have an idea of what exactly she should say, but she said, okay, I guess I'll come in. I'll try it out and see what happens. And she came in there and introduced herself and asked them what they wanted to do. And they kind of started looking at her funny. And they said, why should we tell you? We have people who come in here all the time asking what we care about, what we want, what we're interested in, and then they never come back. And she thought that that was pretty legitimate, and so she made a commitment to come back. And we've kept coming back for 17 years now. And once she was able to engage the trust of the young people there, she was able to find out what they wanted to learn. And what they wanted to learn was about themselves and who they are and where they came from and how they got to be where they are. And so Gateway started with cultural identity programming and has since expanded into currently three programs. All of Gateway's programs are completely dictated by youth needs. The development of the organization over the past 17 years has been thoroughly dictated by requests that they've made, things that they want, things that they need. All of our programs are based around the participatory research and popular education approach to learning. We believe that Communities have the tools to solve their own problems. They know how, they just might not have the resources. And we also believe that everybody has a unique knowledge base that stems from their own experience. And if we can collectively pool those experiences and values and perspectives, that's how we can become fully educated people. And we strive to make education personal and accessible. And Gateways exists with the support of the Green Hill School, especially um, Reggie Parker, her, who serves as our liaison, um, JRA Mentoring with the help of Keith James, the Evergreen State College and its Center for Community-Based Learning and Action, and AmeriCorps, particularly the Retention Project and College Access Grant. To address gateways, or gateways tries to address criminal recidivism and disproportionate minority confinement by working towards these five things. Youth development, when people can explore and challenge and build upon their identities, they're able to achieve success. We're not asking these young people to change who they are, but to challenge what they can become and expand the meaning of that self-proclaimed identity. Cultural awareness. We believe that diversity and cultural awareness is a means to counteract and prevent violence in communities. And when people have a stronger sense of who they are and where they come from, it's easier to engage respectfully with other people who have come from different situations than you have. Education. We believe that developing critical thinking is essential to understanding yourself and your environment, and therefore equipping yourself with tools to be successful in your environment. Academic success. We believe that access to and investment in higher education provides alternatives during and post-incarceration. And last but not least, community collaboration. We believe that our success is built upon the strength, resources, and support of our community and its ability to work together. Gateway is what it is now is a direct product of every single person who's nurtured it over the past 17 years. We currently have three programs. The first is our college class program. And the college class program is facilitated by an evergreen professor and brings evergreen students in to engage in peer learning with Green Hill youth. And it utilizes the popular education and participatory research approach that I mentioned earlier through reading, seminars, writings, and workshops. 
The participation is limited because we are we require that people who participate in the college cost program from Green Hill have at least 17 high school credits and have to get approval from the Green Hill School to engage in that. And they can earn up to two college credits per quarter for participation. Granted, they are active and engaged participants in the classroom. Evergreen State College provides us with a 75% tuition waiver, which leads us to cover the remaining $130 per student per quarter. And around eight to 10 students receive credit per quarter just due to the transient nature of the process. And within all of our programs, that identity work is so essential because everything is tied to identity. And weaving connections is absolutely integral to everything that we do and very much a hallmark of the Evergreen approach to learning. The faculty member will have a different specialty every year, but they work with the youth to develop the curriculum to find a way to make it meet their needs. So we've had faculty whose focuses have been everything from music to political economy to writing and history. One of our other programs is the academic mentoring program. And this is the program that I facilitate at Green Hill. So none of us got to where we were alone. It's incredibly hard to be successful without support. And the academic mentoring program is a bi-weekly, two-hour mentoring program. And we ask our community volunteers to commit to 10 weeks. Most of our volunteers are students at the Evergreen State College. And as a result of that, their class schedules are always fluctuating. So eventually, I would like to get the year-long commitment, but we're not there yet. And within that setting, volunteers and youth engage in one-on-one -on -one or small group mentoring. And when we do have small group, we still try to keep a one-to-one -one ratio for mentors and youth to make sure that everybody's voices can be heard and that everybody is being able to address what they want to address within that setting. We also start every day by doing between a half an hour to hour long group workshop, which focuses on everything from education, dispelling college myths, college readiness, goal setting, identity work, and vocational needs. And this curriculum also is based around what the youth have relayed to us that they want to learn about and what's important for them. After that, they're matched one-on-one -on -one with a mentor to do individual work based around whatever they want. And we ask that, um, or we have a really broad array of things. So there are people working on music production, people working on college applications and personal statements, and people working on you know, remedial math to be able to get ready to graduate high school. Currently, we have 35 youth and amps and 46 since fall. Our mentors also are engaging in weekly workshops to provide them with tools to be effective mentors, as well as they undergo an extensive orientation and training. And the youth in our program also go through an orientation and have check-ins with us about every five weeks. So our latest program, which we're just starting to pilot this year, which is being piloted by my Gateways co-coordinator, Miguel Rodriguez, without whom none of this would be possible, provides support for youth in Gateways during their transitions from Green Hill, because they're not going to be staying at Green Hill forever. And I'd say about over 50% of the youth we work with have Department of Corrections time in their sentencing. And so our continued support with them usually comes through the form of letter writing, emailing through the JPay system, sending books, that kind of thing. So, and then also many of these young people end up going to group homes. And so group homes tend to be more phone call oriented or if they're in the Olympia area, which is where we're based, we've been able to set up mentoring at the facility. And then also when they transition back into communities, whether it is their own communities or new communities. And it's really essential to have that support because 
a lot of the feedback that I've heard is that in Green Hill, there's more support there a lot of the time than there is on the outside. And so we get to do college access, FAFSA stuff, housing. If they're in a community that we can't immediately get to, to facilitate community connections and support and to engage them with people where they're at who can really provide the resources to support their needs and goals. And in terms of mentor participation for the transitional mentoring program, we do ask that our volunteers have been involved in gateways for at least a year, and they also undergo extensive trainings, and we have pretty restrictive policy around that. And one of the best things about the transitional mentoring program is that we get to hear the success stories. When I talk to the staff at Green Hill, a lot of the time, the only, the only news that they get about the people that they work with are bad news, whether it's through a television headline or a newspaper or they see them back at Green Hill. And through the transition mentoring program, we get to hear about how school's going, how work is going, families. And when there are some rough times coming out, we can support them in that facet as well. And so results. There have been 48 youth involved in the program since fall. 10 youth, and the number will soon be 12 because there are two young men in our program who are going to be graduating in June, have received their diploma in the 2010 through 13 school year, and 16 young men received their diploma during the 2011 through 2012 school year. And so far, 15 youth have earned a total of 52 college credits this year. Now, all of our data reporting is primarily through the AmeriCorps Retention Project and College Access Grant Surveys. And so the following data that I'm going to share with you all is from the 2011-2012 AmeriCorps Retention Project and College Access Grant Surveys. So 64.5% of youth reported an increase in enjoying learning new things, a desire to do well in their classes, and thinking that what they learned in class was actually useful to their lives. Sixty-seven percent of youth are now putting more effort into their classes. Eighty-point-six percent of participants are interested in going to college. And eighty-seven percent of youth involved in gateways have a more positive outlook on their education after participating in the program. And I can talk about gateways until I am blue in the face, but nobody can articulate the experience and impact of gateways more effectively than the young men at Green Hill. And I think that their voices need to be included in this discussion. And so I wanted to share with you some testimonials because at the end of the day, it's, it's about these young men and how we can best serve them. So I think gateways is great. It gives incarcerated youth the chance to meet with college students and mingle with them. It helps to develop a desire to attend college because you surround yourself with college students who are committed to their education, and they become idols. I think overall Gateways is an amazing program that helps juveniles to think about their future. Gateways has been cool. I never saw myself going to college. For my first experience, I enjoyed it. From the people who are different than others I know to the work we do and how we interact while doing it. This college class has made me want to do more because there's a lot I don't know, and if I don't further my education, I won't know. Thank you so much, Naomi. Before we move forward, let's all take a breather, and let's just give a round of applause to the three phenomenal young women that you've heard from today. Yasmeen Arrington, your moderator, who has now left us to go take a test, Starsu Agu, and Naomi Talkman Kaplan. Thanks to all of you young ladies. Such a great role model for those that, come, that, that have yet to follow. Before we get to our final pr presenter and before um, our end of the show uh, Q&A session with Paul Kuttner and Monica Ng, let's just take a moment. Um, I'd like to ask the, the audience, how many of you are actually uh, teaching in a detention facility or an alternative school and in what state? Please send me information via your chat window so everyone can see your response. Again, the question is, 
are you teaching in a detention facility or in an alternative school or a community school? And if so, where? Share that information with all of us, please. Let us know where you're doing your great work. We see that we've heard now from Illinois and Tennessee Community School, Hope for Youth in New York, Alternative School in Virginia, Pennsylvania, thank you, Treatment Center in Pennsylvania, D.C. and Ypsilanti, Michigan. Did I pronounce that right? Ypsilanti. Mm -hmm. Tahlequah, Oklahoma. And a state correctional center for girls. We got a, a variety of different facilities that are being represented here today, and folks from around the U.S. who are working daily to hopefully remove some of the burden from kids and provide them another opportunity for success once they leave the detention facilities. I'd like to say thank you all for joining us today. And while you continue to respond, I have a question for Starcia. Starcia, you mentioned that education was the key to your success, and it's no doubt that it has been. What do you think were two critical um, or two critical things or two greatest catalysts or contributors to your belief, to your educational belief and becoming a successful adult? Um, I would, I think that I would say, uh, let's see, the two things. Well, one is actually just, I think the very most important thing is for most of our kids that are in the juvenile justice system, um, they uh, they usually have a, a long history of some type of trauma, substance abuse, mental, mental health issues, and they've never really had any consistent support or mentoring or people to care about them. So um, the structure and the support, those things were all very important. And then um, I think that's it for now. Thank you, Starcia, for that response. So here's a question for um, several questions and follow-up things for you, um, Naomi. Folks wanted to know more about um, some of the example or ways that cultural awareness is being addressed at gateways. Can you give at least one, an example or two in terms of how you integrate cultural awareness into your um, curriculum there? Culture. Culture in general is just such an integral part of our programming, and so that sense of reflection in terms of who am I, where do I come from, is essential in all of our programming. And in terms of our staff, our staff all has a fairly extensive history in anti-oppression work, trainings, and personal reflections besides that. And it's, it's knowing that nobody is a single representative of anything but their own experience and coming from a lens of valuing everybody's experience and valuing everybody's knowledge and being aware that everybody has something to contribute. One more question for you, Naomi, around the cultural awareness. Is yes. there a um, specific type of training that staff receive to support cultural awareness? And if so, can you share that training with your audience? Staff or mentors or both? Both, please. Really, the primary basis of what we do is through discussions and seminaring. So it can go between reading articles or having discussions, doing personal writings, and then sharing them with each other, and really being willing to be brave and courageous in addressing and dissecting some of the stuff that isn't fun to think about but is absolutely important to integrate into your daily life. Thank you so much, Naomi. And we've got time for a question that I would actually like um, Starcia as well as um, you, Naomi, to respond to. We'll start with Starcia. I'm, the audience is curious about and want to know more about how they can advocate for an end to the school-to-prison pipeline on the outside. 
as well as more about reentry support. So what feedback, what um, expertise would either of you share on what they can personally do to help in the school to prison pipeline issue? Starcia, we'll start with you. OK, yeah, that's a really great question. Um, I'm not sure that I have the answer, but I'll do my best. I, I think the most important thing that we can do is educate people about the kind of kids that we have in our system. I oftentimes think that the media and um, politicians campaigning on tough on crime doesn't really help our youth, um, doesn't really help our youth from the ones who are getting in trouble not entering the system. So really be able to just talk with um, the community and politicians and work on creating a coalition of people um, because numbers really matter to um, help bring awareness to the issue. That would be, that would be my I also thank you. And, and and before we go before we go to Naomi, um, Starcy, could you just give some examples of some critical folks that you find are important to be a part of that coalition that you reference? Who are some of the players that um, need to be at the table? Uh, that's a really great question too. I think that we have to have a little bit of any uh, everybody who. Um, the different stages of the system that actually touch the kids, so the police, the prosecutors, community members, family, youth, um, uh, let's see who else, juvenile justice folks, the school folks, administrators, politicians. I feel like you really have to have a very well-rounded group of people from different walks of life so that, um, so that there's less opposition. Um, defenders, kind of just a, uh, a really wide variety of people who touch the lives of these, these kids who end up in our system. Thank you so much, Starcia. And now, Naomi, to you, the same question. How can we advocate an end to the school to prison pipeline on the outside? What would you tell our audience today? I can only speak from what I know best, which is a community approach. and. I think it's so important for young people to know that they're valued and cared about and that they have something to offer. And so it would just be with the young people that you interact with, listen to them, let them know that they're cared about, let them know that they matter and that their choices matter and believe in them even at the times when they don't believe in themselves. And especially in the education system, there's so much historical trauma, especially culturally related, within the systems and just to be open and willing and to not, not give up on them. And again, I, I really do want to second what Starsha said about reimagining the face of who these young people are because there is such a distorted perception of what an incarcerated youth is. And yeah, just, just care and, and, and collaborate, you know, schools and mentoring organizations and teachers and community organizations and all of that kind of thing. Thank you, Naomi. One last question before we go to our final um, panelists today. And Naomi, I believe this is for you. Someone is asking specifically, you made a reference, I believe, to college courses. And um, they're wanting to know, uh, specifically, when you say that students are completing college courses, are they also enrolling in college? Um, and then secondly, is this definition of college the traditional four-year degree, or are students doing interest inventories to make wise choices, choices as to the variety of high skill careers that require certifications and or post-secondary studies below the BA level? I know that was lengthy, so let's break it up. So let's talk about college course. Were you yeah, referencing our, the four-year kind? Our students are enrolled as temporary students at the Evergreen State College, which is an accredited four-year institution. And so the credits that they're earning are credits that are applicable at a four-year institution. They're enrolled as special, special admin students. Thank you. All right. That's our Q&A segment for now. We have one more coming up. And I'm excited to introduce our next presenter. 
who is Simone Gonsolin. Mr. Gonsolin is a principal researcher for the American Institutes for Research. He works as the Juvenile Justice Resource Supervisor across two projects for the State Training and Technical Assistance Center and the Technical Assistance Partnership. Simone Gonsolin. Thanks, Michelle. I appreciate that. It's uh, wonderful to be with you today in the webinar. And uh, as an individual who has uh, worked in the field of education and juvenile justice uh, for over 30 years, it's very, very exciting to uh, hear uh, from Yasmin and Starcy and Naomi uh, to, to really see the level of passion they have, the wonderful uh, thinking that they have going on and the advocacy that they have moving forward. Uh, to, to move the field in the direction that it needs to go. So there are really good outcomes uh, for kids who find themselves in the juvenile justice system. So before really moving into some of the content uh, that I wanted to share with you today, we thought it might be a good idea to uh, look at sort of a thumbnail sketch of, of youngsters, uh, as far as their education is concerned, who do find themselves in the juvenile justice system. Uh, we know that uh, most of the youth who come to the system are reading and calculating math, three more grade levels below their peers who are non-system involved. Uh, we also know that 80% of the youth uh, have been suspended and 50% have been expelled from school the year prior to uh, their confinement. We know that uh, youth in the deep end of the system have in fact been retained at the rate of about six, six out of 10 kids uh, who find themselves there. Uh, and 66% of the boys and 75% of the girls uh, meet diagnostic criteria, diagnostic criteria for psychiatric disorders. And we all know that there's a huge number of kids, and, and this was mentioned a little earlier, who have experienced a considerable amount of trauma, uh, who are youngsters who find themselves in our system. Over 40% are eligible for IDEA services or special educational services, and the two most common educational disabilities are learning disabilities and uh, emotional behavioral disorders. Uh, their needs are many, and uh, quality educational programming uh, must be a priority uh, in confinement. Uh, if we want to promote practice and positive practices for kids uh, and positive youth development, it's going to be through education that this will occur. So I wanted to just kind of go over some of the necessary components of facility-based educational programs. Uh, and these are, are rather general. Uh, but as you look at ensuring that appropriate educational services are provided for youth uh, in the facilities, certainly these are areas you want to con consider. Uh, in the chat box, we've noticed some questions and comments made by participants, and many of them have fallen into these categories. So I'm pretty excited about that, that, uh, that, that in fact, you know, this is in tune with some of the things that you want to hear more about and that you think are important uh, within your program. We know that personnel is critically important. Uh, we know that teachers who work within the facilities as well as school administrators should hold the same credentials as teachers and administrators in the public school system. There should clearly be a teacher accountability and evaluation program where instruction is monitored uh, and also support staff uh, is, is uh, presented uh, and also their work is, is, mo is monitored as well and uh, evaluated. There should be a pool of substitute teachers because oftentimes you find in juvenile justice facilities, if a teacher has to be out because of an illness, that sometimes classes are combined or, or you know, worse yet, classes are actually canceled. And also there should be a focus on staff development. This has been mentioned by all three presenters so far. And the staff development for teachers, especially in school administrators, should not only focus on staff development related issues around juvenile justice education, but also around educational issues in the community because uh, teachers uh, and administrators in the facilities need to be well aware of, you know, what are the trends, what are the issues uh, coming forward uh, in the education field in the community. Secondly is instruction. We need to consider such things as class size. The pupil-teacher ratio is critically important, especially when you look at youngsters who have educational disabilities. Uh, the length of the school day in facilities is something that oftentimes you know, is not at the same level uh, as youngsters who are receiving schooling in the community. Uh, we also have to look at the, the school environment. Is it conducive to a, a teaching learning process? Uh, do youth uh, across the facility have access to equal educational services? So this means that youngsters in the infirmary or youth in seclusion, do they in fact receive educational services or, or handouts or dittos or, or those sorts of things just sort of dropped off for kids who are not attending uh, the community school, so to speak, there in the facility. 
Special education and 504 supports and services are critical for our kids. Uh, the authority that has responsibility for educational services uh, should provide adequate special educational services inclusive of uh, the, those services such as speech therapy, occupational or physical therapy, uh, school-based counseling so that youngsters can benefit from their education uh, at, at a different level or a, a, a more robust level so that they can learn uh, without having their behavior interfere uh, with that teaching and learning process. We want to make sure that parents are involved in education decision, educational decision making for uh, their youngsters as well. And that there is a functioning school building level committee or uh, a team that really sort of uh, takes a look at uh, students who are struggling uh, in their education or struggling there uh, within facility life uh, so that we can assist them uh, in a more individualized, very specific manner. Pre-vocation and career technical education, of course, is critically important for our kids. Uh, and uh, we want to make sure that pre-vocational content is integrated into the curriculum, especially in the areas of language arts and math. We want to make sure that workplace ethics and those soft job skills are also embedded within our academic classes so that youngsters can prepare better for the career technical sort of services uh, and, and, and programs that we'll participate in. You want to ensure that your career uh, technical uh, curriculum guides are aligned with the state's career technical curriculum guides. Uh, and once again, you want to make sure that the services within the facilities are comparable to non-system uh, involved youth uh, throughout the state. Uh, if you look at library services, sometimes people wonder well, why you put library services in here, but they are very critical as well because if you have a, a trained school librarian on staff, they can help teachers to supplement the education uh, for using the classroom. Uh, this trained uh, library media specialist or librarian uh, can ensure that there is a leisure reading opportunities for youth, both on the dormitory and also in the school setting to encourage uh, some of those uh, positive behaviors there. And then also uh, you want to make sure that this trained school librarian is present uh, to ensure that the standards within the secondary schools in your state uh, are met within the library services there in the facility. Uh, the second to last item is materials and equipment. Um, all, all equipment should be under, with good repair. They should be replaced when it's, when it's, when it's no longer working or discarded. Uh, if in fact it cannot be repaired, this is something when you go into a lot of juvenile justice schools, you will see a lot of equipment that is not usable for the kids or the staff. So uh, there must be an adequate budget established to support education, instructional materials and equipment in order to be able to meet the needs and the goals of the teachers uh, as well as the students. And a final necessary component to ensure that you have a quality facility-based education program is an ongoing continuous quality improvement effort. So the CQI process and instrument should be built around these seven components uh, that we've just gone through and also uh, there must be ongoing and frequent monitoring of the program and constant feedback uh, for teaching staff and school administrators uh, as well. Anyone interested in improving educational outcomes for youth who are system involved should refer to the Center for Juvenile Justice Reform's white paper entitled Meeting the Unmet Educational Needs of Children and Youth Who Are in the Child Welfare and Juvenile Justice Systems. The monograph uh, was written by Peter Leone and Lois Weinberg and the necessary components of facility-based education programs just shared with you are contemplated in this white paper. The monograph names six uh, principles that should drive educational service for youth who are system involved. And, and really this is not just within the facility. This is, these would be educational services for youth who are system involved across all educational settings. So from the community school to possibly an alternative school, uh, to day treatment programs, uh, all, a group home sort of setting, if that's where the schooling is taking place. So across all educational settings, these are the six principles they feel as though it should really drive some of your decision making. The first one is quality education services are critical. Uh, and we're kind of running short on time, so I'm going to move through this rather quickly because we can, we can access, you can access this particular guide and we'll give you that information. Uh, at the end of the webinar. As a matter of fact, I think Michelle may, may even send it out to uh, folks who have participated. The second principle is early education is essential. We know that a lot of youngsters uh, who are within the juvenile justice system are vulnerable youth and experience trauma 
uh, and and uh, situations in their lives that they had absolutely no control over. But those uh, those particular concerns uh, have in fact uh, impacted those youth and their educational outcomes. Outcomes that matter are measured, uh, and this goes back to that continuous quality improvement uh, component that I was talking about a little earlier. Uh, there must be greater accountability, and also we must provide effective programs and determine whether or not these programs are achieving the outcomes that, in fact, we think they should be. Uh, individually tailored support services uh, for use are provided. Uh, this is where you want to employ evidence-based academic and behavioral interventions to improve performance both academically and socially so that youngsters uh, can uh, maintain control of their behaviors and also move through that educational continuum uh, at a rate that is that will allow them to be successful. A fifth principle is interagency communication and collaboration is vital. Uh, we know that one agency or one entity cannot do it alone. The school system cannot do it alone. The mental health system cannot uh, meet the needs of every child within the juvenile justice system. The child welfare system needs to be involved, juvenile justice system, education. It goes across all agencies. And it's only through, uh, through effective communication and collaboration that we'll see some positive outcomes and uh, agencies will stop operating within silos. The final principle is to change, if change, change requires within agency and cross-agency leadership. Uh, we want to clarify expectations here. We want to uh, improve access uh, to services. And it's only through the leadership within the agency and then across agencies when you're working through that interagency communication and collaboration that we'll see some real positive outcomes there. Following the release of the white paper uh, with the six principles I just reviewed, uh, and a very successful education symposium, Shea Bilchak, who is the executive director of the Center for Juvenile Justice Reform, approached NDTAC, the Center that I'm a project director for, and asked that we write practice guides based on the six principles found in the Leone Weinberg paper that might help to drive policy, practice, and system reform to achieve better educational outcomes for system involved youth. The first guide dealt with improving educational outcomes for youth in the juvenile justice and child welfare systems through interagency communication and collaboration. The most recent guide, and the one that we'll focus on today, uh, deals with the principle of individual tailored academic and behavioral supports and services should be provided to foster better outcomes. Uh, as I mentioned a little earlier, copies of the guides uh, and also the white paper from uh, the Center for Juvenile Justice Reform can be sent to you uh, following the webinar. This principle addresses the academic hardships faced by youth involved in the system that may have been caused by life-changing events, decisions and conditions such as numerous changes in placement, family mobility, exposure to trauma, disabling conditions, economic disadvantage, uh, and involvement in multiple systems that all too often operate in silos. Juvenile justice education providers need to provide supports uh, that are needed uh, to address each student's unique needs. As Leone and Weinberg noted, the evidence-based academic and social skills interventions described in their monograph uh, need to become standard practices for these youth across all educational settings, inclusive of settings in secure care, such as secure care. Although high-quality curriculum uh, and instruction are important for all students, those students most at risk for not achieving uh, to their potential should be afforded the supplemental support and encouragement needed to overcome barriers and meet high expectations. To not do so ignores the effect that systems involvement has on these youth and denies far too many young people the educational opportunities and achievements they deserve. When we look at this second practice guide that uh, NDTAC pulled together, uh, you can see that there are five practices that go across the top of the page from right to left. And these practices are, uh, are suggested ways that uh, leaders, policymakers, folks who make decisions about budgets should really help to drive policy uh, and the practices within that particular, uh, within that particular agency. Uh, and then the strategies that fall below uh, are strategies that we feel as though are good steps that the agencies can take under each one of those practices to actually implement uh, the practices. So I'll quickly go through those five practices and we'll move into some of those strategies. Uh, so this table sort of presents those practices and strategies. Uh, the first one is to collect and use data to identify needs and develop learning plans for the youth. 
Second practice, implement procedures to ensure smooth transitions. The third practice is to address gaps in academic skills and accelerate uh, the learning process. Fourth is to instruct students in ways that engage them in the learning. And finally, address behavioral and social needs to promote educational success. So the first practice of collect and use data to identify students' needs and develop plans. Uh, uh, we've identified three strategies that we think are pretty important. Uh, but the, before I get into those, uh, into those particular strategies, the use of data to make educational decisions uh, is an expectation in all educational settings. However, the reality is that using data systematically and coherently takes considerable skill and understanding, especially when youth find themselves being educated in a juvenile justice facility or a restrictive setting. For example, the Family Education Rights and Privacy Act, better known as FERPA, uh, mandates uh, the confidentiality of juvenile education records is aimed at protecting children from unauthorized disclosure of educational records and is often cited as a reason one placement cannot transfer student records to the next. However, FERPA does allow for flexibility, and many jurisdictions are successfully sharing records without violating confidentiality. As a matter of fact, in your handout pod, there is uh, a link to the FERPA Mythbuster, which was just released by the U.S. Department of Education, that focuses on a myth and also how you can bust the myth through a fact around uh, exchanging of records for youth who are involved, uh, educational records for youth who are involved in the juvenile justice system. So take some time to take a look at that when you have a chance. That with students in any school setting, examining, examining student uh, performance and, uh, and data and the relevant information needs to be the foundational practice that uh, undergirds all programming decisions. Schools can examine both academic and non-academic information and tailor practice and programming to students' needs identified through this data. So you have those three strategies there, uh, and there is one that I'll spend a little more time on, and that's uh, the development and maintain, maintenance of uh, personal learning plans. Once student records uh, and other formal and informal data uh, are obtained, teachers and other school personnel, such as guidance counselors and transition coordinators, need to monitor and systematically assess students' progress and create plans based on that data for the student's success. As a way of doing this, some schools implement personal learning plans or individualized learning plans for students. So these, for your, these are for your non-disabled students who do not have IEPs. To be effective, a personal learning plan uh, needs to include appropriate academic and non-academic data. So a real quick thumbnail sketch uh, of that particular youth's needs would be a good way to start this uh, personal learning plan. So anybody who picks this uh, personal learning plan up can get a real good picture of what the youngster's needs are uh, and where we really need to concentrate our efforts. The plan should also include goals, course credits that have been accumulated uh, both prior to movement to this particular education setting and also um, uh, credits earned while in this setting. Uh, any other interventions that have been in place either historically that have worked well with the youth or some that are actually you're, you're engaging in today that have been very, very successful. For personal learning plans uh, to successfully meet the needs of youth, uh, they must be based on current, accurate information about the youth's educational competencies and skills, including the possibility of educational and other disabilities. It's important in developing uh, these plans uh, to engage the students and family members or other caring adults who, who are responsible individuals within that youngster's life so they can inform uh, the school staff and assist in setting the goals for the youth's uh, future. These plans take time to implement and they must be kept up to date. Therefore, it is, uh, it is valuable to establish a systematic process for implementing personal learning plans across the agency uh, and across multiple settings. As students get older and progress in the educational uh, system and move to a different level, they can take more ownership of their plan uh, and use it to set their own future goals. And this is another way of engaging youth uh, in the educational process. Uh, to help students with this, it's important for schools and systems to create tools and templates uh, for completing the plan, setting goals, and conducting conferences. One thing that I did want to mention is uh, one of the sections of each guide, uh, we provide examples and resources. And we actually have three different states' uh, personal learning plans uh, identified, the templates are identified for you there within the resource section 
Uh, you can click on the link to each state's uh, personal learning plan, and you can see what other states are doing uh, in this particular area. Uh, the, second, uh, let's here. the second practice is implementing procedures to ensure smooth transition. There are four particular strategies uh, identified here for you, uh, and I'm going to really focus in on one of them at this point. Uh, we want to include transition activities in the student's personal learning plan. So we just talked about the personal learning plan, how it can help guide some decisions and direction for that youngster's education. We want to ensure that transition activities are uh, a mandatory part of that youngster's personal learning plan. So we know the barriers to successful transition. Uh, all juvenile justice settings need to have transition supports and activities uh, in place uh, for both departing and arriving students. Uh, one uh, logical step is to include transition activities in the youngster's plan. And school and facility staff should consider a few of these strategies when they're really looking at transition uh, for youth. Number one, establish opportunities for staff across the various school levels and across educational settings as well as youth and family members to meet and jointly plan transition activities. We want to provide an orientation to prepare students to enter subsequent placements or settings. Uh, oftentimes youth can receive a pass or a furlough uh, if they are in a secure care setting uh, to actually go to their community school, meet the principal, meet the guidance counselor, determine who the supports are for that youngster at that particular school. And it is a very effective use of time uh, and, and the youngster feels a little more supported and more engaged in the process there. Uh, implement specific strategies to engage the student in school activities. So are there organizations that the youngster might be able to get engaged in or, or certain support groups? How about reviewing data on entering students uh, for our teachers in a secure care setting? You know, collecting those records as quickly as you can, getting that out to, to the teachers who are going to be uh, providing instructional services for the youngster. Uh, and then making sure they have the opportunity to review them quickly so they can make better decisions for the youngster uh, while they have them uh, in their classes. Practice three uh, was addressing gaps uh, in academic skills uh, and accelerating the learning process. So I identified three strategies that you may want to consider uh, in addressing this particular practice. And um, the one that I want to cover here is the use of explicit or scaffolded instruction. Um, uh, when instruction is scaffolded, teachers strategically select the content, and then they break it down into manageable instructional units based on the student's ability to make sense of the content. Students could have varying abilities to learn of the content relative to their working memory, their attention, and also prior knowledge. Once the content has been selected and broken into manageable learning units, Teachers, provide clear, teachers will provide clear uh, descriptions, demonstrations, especially through modeling of the skills uh, followed by supported practice and timely feedback. Uh, th there are multiple elements of explicit instruction. Uh, one is to focus instruction on the critical content. Remember, our kids oftentimes have gaps in their learning, so we need to go to the instruction uh, that would truly help them to close those gaps and want to accelerate that learning process. The teacher will teach in very small segments in a logical, sequential manner, provide step-by-step -step demonstrations, provide a range of examples and also non-examples. Because oftentimes, that really helps a youngster to identify what this particular content is not or what a particular philosophy is when you think of civics or those sorts of things. I help students optimize their knowledge and provide op multiple opportunities for youth to actually take the newly acquired skills and uh, put them into practice. So the fourth uh, practice that we wanted to share with you is to instruct students in ways that engage them uh, in the learning process. And you know, oftentimes if you have been a teacher in a juvenile justice facility or if you've been a teacher period or worked in a school setting, oftentimes you hear from at-risk youth, so what's in it for me? And, and I think that's what really focuses you in on practice four. I mean, if you're not going to engage the youth, you're not going to be able to answer that question for that youngster. So one of the uh, strategies I want to cover today is to engage youth in that education, uh, in educational decision making. Uh, engaging students in their own educational decision making begins with soliciting their feedback on their educational experiences and goals. Uh, this can be accomplished formally or informally and helps to inform action steps towards promoting overall school success. Uh, feedback should be supplemented by school records. Uh, you might want to include assessment results and evaluations. 
of previous work, and also past learning plans, uh, such as IEPs or 504 plans. Uh, more complete information uh, will better allow school staff to initiate frank conversations and discussion with youth, and youth will certainly realize that this is an adult that I can connect to, this adult is interested in uh, meeting my needs, and it's somebody they, they can in fact trust there at the facility or at any school across any educational setting. Having family members or other caring adults take an active role in this process by supplying educational related information uh, for the creation of the educational plan is extremely critical and adds a degree of accountability and accuracy to our planning for the youth. Uh, and, and we all know that the more parents are involved in the process, uh, the, the better, in fact, uh, the outcomes are for youth. Uh, the Vera um, Institute just completed a study where they have uh, preliminarily determined that youth who receive parental visits from, uh, from parents or caring adults in their lives do better in school while in facilities and also, in fact, uh, have fewer disciplinary write-ups. Okay, I'm getting the high five here that we need to move this along. So we'll go to practice five. Uh, the practice five is addressing behavioral and social needs to promote educational success. Uh, and this certainly is where we want to align behavior management approaches across settings uh, and, and domains. But what I want to make sure we cover here, and, and you, can, you can do this in a juvenile justice correctional setting, we have to really look at the conditions for learning. Are the conditions for learning appropriate for that youngster to learn and for the teacher to teach? That's so critically important. So the issue of safety, engagement, and also challenging work, supports needed for the teacher and also supports needed for the youth are critically important around the whole conditions for learning uh, uh, equation. And then also the social and emotional learning piece where we help youth, youth manage their emotions and also to surround themselves uh, with more positive peers uh, as, as they make some decisions for themselves along the way. So the, the final uh, strategy I want to just cover is aligning behavior management approaches across settings and domains. Addressing the behavioral needs of youth within the juvenile justice system must be uh, thoughtfully considered and consistently dealt with across all settings uh, within the juvenile justice facility, inclusive of the school setting. Uh, so of course it's critically important to have in place programs that are evidence-based, such as positive uh, behavioral interventions and supports, which we know are heavily utilized in schools across the country where there's a growing number of juvenile justice facility schools who do in fact uh, implement PBIS strategies and uh, especially in addressing the needs of the bulk of the students uh, around behavior related issues uh, and also to improve uh, their educational outcomes. Incorporating the guide into practice, you know, it's one thing to have a guide, but you want to make sure that there is a way to incorporate this work into, into your, your daily uh, uh, work responsibilities as a teacher or school administrator. So we really want to look at uh, incorporating the guide in these four particular ways. I'm, just, I'm not going to go through any of these activities with you, but there are four additional slides that take you through a sample staff development activity that uh, school administrators or leaders uh, can work with their staff members uh, in utilizing the guides, practices, and strategies, as well as the white papers principles, uh, and apply them to your setting. So I would just suggest that you might utilize those down the line. And finally, the last slide identifies just one page of the resources and examples at the back of the guide, where you can actually link into uh, a particular protocol, or you can link into a particular document to see how other states are addressing personal learning plans, uh, how uh, individuals are receiving student records uh, from one uh, school system to the next. So some states have actually passed legislation to make that happen. So thanks for allowing me to be on the webinar today, and I think there might be a couple of minutes for questions. Is that right? Yes, um, we do have a couple minutes for questions before we get into our final segment. Thanks so much, Simone. Lots of great information. I hope you all took an opportunity um, to take some notes. Um, there were lots of great tools, great tips, principles and practices for consideration. Um, I hope that all of you are starting to reevaluate um, the work that you're currently doing that's going to impact um, young people and their opportunity for fostering um, educa their educational pursuits. 
So really quick, Simone, I want to get one question out mm -hmm. because someone asked early on whether or not those national those statistics that you referenced early on, the 60% have been, 40% mm -hmm. um, uh, were eligible for IDA services, and you mentioned a number of things. But those right. national st statistics. Yes, those are national statistics. That's correct. Right. And, and you've seen them at the state level range from as low as 23%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 
to uh, ascertain a, a, a furlough or a pass for that youngster to go to their home based school, get reintroduced to some of the, the staff there, let that staff member know and that administrator know that this youngster has been uh, uh, participating in treatment, has been successful in school, uh, and has accomplished things while they were, in fact, uh, confined. That goes a long way of, uh, to, to helping that relationship uh, become stronger. One other question, Simone, we're going to ask you before we wrap it up here and move to our last segment. And remember, folks, we're staying on till 4 p.m. Eastern time today, so you all will have an opportunity to engage with the uh, co-editors of the book. Um, reversing the, the uh, excuse me, reversing the prison to pipeline. Paul Kuttner as well as Monica Ng. So just a, mi just a minute. One other question for Mr. Gonsolin. Um, Simone, the 40% figure, mm -hmm. is it relative to IDEA eligible students specifically within the JJ system or all students in general? No, no, this is strictly the youth who are uh, within the uh, this will not be all youth uh, who are in the public school system. So uh, that's why we did that thumbnail sketch at the very beginning, kind of giving you that thumbnail sketch of the educational needs who are in the, uh, of the youth who are in the juvenile justice system. Uh, so yes, just focused on that population. Okay, thank you so much for that. So you'll see here on your screen there are some additional resources that some of you did not get a chance to note earlier. But if you have the PowerPoint, which each of you should have received a copy prior to the start today, you will see the resources there on the screen as well as some of the URLs that are available for you to access the information. Additionally, I will be sending out some additional supportive material that um, Simone referenced that each of you are requesting. I have all of your email addresses and I will be certain that we send it to you within the next uh, 48 hours. Uh, and lastly, um, I hope that you, you stay on with us because we're about to have a Q&A segment that will last about 30 minutes. But if for some reason you have to leave for a meeting, I would encourage you to take the uh, evaluation URL, place it in your browser, and please respond to the evaluation. But without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to Starcia Agu, who will introduce our next panelist. Starcia? Yeah, I hope that you guys do decide to stay. I uh, had the honor and privilege of going uh, to the Harvard Education Grad School and doing a panel with Paul and Monica. And they did a very uh, just wonderful job. The Harvard Educational Review Journal was a big hit and um, really has a lot of different perspectives from youth and family, incarcerated folks, um, the school administrators, uh, a whole bunch of uh, a wide variety of um, perspectives in the book. And so, um, Monica and Paul, welcome, and thank you so much for joining us. Thank you so much, Sarja, and thank you all, all of you for these fabulous uh, presentations. This has just been a thrill to be able to be sitting in on. Um, so Monica and I are here, and we're also uh, we're representing three of our co-editors, uh, Sophia Bahena, North Cook, and uh, Rachel Curry Rubin. Uh, just briefly, uh, we'll move for a slide forward. Uh, we will share with you the, the book that we recently put out uh, through the Harvard Educational Review. It is called Disrupting the School to Prison Pipeline, uh, and it's an edited volume. And as Starsha was saying, we really sought to have a wide range of voices, and we were very fortunate to have Starsha write a piece in this book um, based around the story that she told you earlier, a really powerful work, um, and that is alongside um, other young people and adults who have been incarcerated, uh, students, lawyers, teachers, researchers, really trying to come at this concept of the school to prison pipeline from, um, from multiple angles. Our, we saw uh, a field that was really looking very separately at different pieces of what people now call the school to prison pipeline, looking specifically. And so we wanted to, to address the multiple entry points um, for those of us who want to disrupt uh, this particular phenomenon, looking at, at people working at the school level, working uh, people working at juvenile detention level, as well as, as adult prisons. Um, if you want to move to the next slide. 
uh, we the the book comes is basically in three parts. It begins with uh, a look at discipline and justice in schools and the way that uh, schools are um, are often pushing out students and uh, either directly or indirectly leading them towards the criminal justice system. Uh, the second section is on education and detention, which is really focused on what we've been talking about today, which is education for those students who have left or been pushed out of, of traditional education uh, opportunities. And finally, uh, transforming the pipeline looks at, uh, at, more, at broader systemic efforts to address the pipeline on multiple levels. And so we're happy to, to answer questions about any of these. We wanted to start uh, just by reflecting a little bit on some of the, the key themes that came out of these three fabulous presentations. Uh, I just want to pull out, um, uh, and which also resonate with what we've learned, uh, where we hope in this question and answer period we can draw on the combined wisdom of the fabulous authors that we were able to work with. Um, see a couple of themes emerging. One of, one of them is, which we saw in, in our work and we've heard some today, is there's something of a, of a, a, a tension or, or a, almost an irony in, in this idea of uh, education uh, in detention. Because uh, on the one hand, there's, there's research that has shown that, there, that a lot of detention facilities really lack, uh, as Starsha was speaking, uh, lack opportunities for education uh, for young people and adults. And there is a lot of work to do to fulfill the rights that young people in detention have uh, to a quality education. At the same time, we hear stories like those we've heard today, and we've heard from many others who wrote to us, that many people are having really very powerful educational experiences in detention, and some, for some of them is the first time someone has really believed in them and felt they could learn. And so this to us really speaks to both a tremendous need and opportunity uh, to, to create change as well as uh, models of, uh, to build on. The second thing I'd like to, to address is this broader idea, which I heard in all of these uh, presentations, which is this question of youth voice. Um, youth, you know, we've, we've heard, I, I think, uh, on the one hand, we've heard about youth, youth voice in terms of uh, people like Yasmin and Starsha sharing their, in, their individual stories and really needing to get those stories out, which is one thing that we, we hope to do through, uh, through this publication. But also, um, we've heard from these presentations about young people uh, having decision-making power uh, over their education, over their experiences of incarceration and re-entry, and forming, you know, in different ways, um, really letting young people lead, lead us through uh, what is needed uh, in these institutions. And I would like to broaden that a little bit because I think in many ways, it's young people's voices that are leading the broader effort to transform the pipeline uh, through youth and intergenerational organizing across the country who really pushed this and really have to, can take a lot of the credit for this being a, a major issue at the national level where we hear this idea of a school to prison pipeline being used by Arnie Duncan and, and people at the federal level. This is largely due to tremendous grassroots efforts of advocates and youth and their families. So we would like to uh, open up uh, for, I believe Michelle had a question um, to start, but uh, we are happy to discuss uh, any of the connections um, that have been brought up today uh, or anything else that we've looked at in our book. Thank you, Paul. Um, let's hear from from uh, I know Monica, the, your co-editor, is sitting next to you, and um, let's hear some of her thoughts about her work on this book. Um, I think that when we began this book, we, uh, the five editors, we all came at it with a very sort of different angle of why we were interested. And Paul, as you can guess um, from his response, was really interested in the youth organizing piece. Um, myself and another editor, North Cook, we were interested in the special, uh, special education aspect of it. We know that um, assigning students into special education and then into segregated classrooms is one way in which uh, students sort of begin this gradual push out. We were also really interested in looking at suspension and discipline policies that are happening in schools, and we're really excited. We um, have a piece by Dan Lawson who looked uh, at a lot of statistics, national statistics around uh, discipline policies and makes some really strong 
recommendations around schools doing better data collection around who is being suspended, uh, what kinds of uh, suspensions are being issued, what um, students who are expelled, and really asking districts to keep good records of those and states to keep good records of those so we can begin to examine those. And I think that's been an, a theme, again, throughout these presentations is the importance of data uh, to support claims around what is happening in schools. Uh, I was a teacher myself for many years, and so I think uh, looking at what happens in schools, so one of the things that an author mentions in one of the pieces is that Chicago, for example, um, you know, is choosing to spend seven million dollars on uh, surveillance equipment for their for their schools, um, and in the meantime, you know, there are so many needs around children's mental health. Um, you know, how powerful would it be if we had positive behavior interventions and supports in all those schools, um, opportunities to um, uh, really meet students' needs in a more uh, sensitive way. And I, I think that uh, our book has a couple of different pieces that I really appreciated for their ability to say there are things we can be doing right now that would uh, significantly improve uh, the current environment within schools for students. And then as well as some thoughtful ways that we can begin to think about education within juvenile detention centers. The other piece that I do want Paul to talk about too is he is very also committed to the arts. And it's very interesting for us to note that um, we've taken the arts, so much of the arts has come out of schools, and yet arts uh, in prisons is actually becoming a more common uh, way in which to engage youth. And so he did a review of several books that looked at these kinds of programs that engaged students in arts and drama, theater, music, to really get them uh, reengaged in their learning. Um, does the book consider the effect of restorative practices in schools in reducing suspensions, expulsions, and oh, sorry. Excellent. Thank you, Monica. Here is, um, there are a couple of questions that have rolled in for um, you all. Here are two questions specifically around restorative practices. Are restorative practices Discipline practices discussed specifically within your book? And if so, is there a presentation overview of how effective and or how these restorative practices have impacted schools? Uh, yes. No, I am glad people brought, uh, brought that up right away. We have a couple of pieces looking at restorative justice, and I think restorative justice is uh, definitely one of the most promising ways of intervening, I think, both at school level and um, at the at the, level, at the point where young people are connected to the juvenile justice system, particularly since restorative justice, these practices that are basically for those who haven't been involved with them, but restorative practices that try to shift away from punitive, uh, from solely punitive approaches to dealing with, um, with discipline issues in schools or really any kind of conflict and moving towards a healing orientation. And we have a couple pieces in our book. We, uh, I, said, I had the opportunity to sit down with a group of restorative justice practitioners, including teachers, students, and community members in Boston who are doing fabulous work in some of the schools here. Um, and and we, we have a, a transcript of that in the book. We also, there's some really good work being done in Chicago on restorative justice because um, it's one of the, partly due to a massive amount of youth organizing in the, in the city, restorative justice um, practices are being supported in schools. Uh, and it is absolutely clear that people going through these programs, when they're done well, have very transformative experiences. Um, we have reports from people like this group in Charlestown High here in Boston that this is transforming the culture of their school. Uh, towards a sort of a more restorative culture. So it moves beyond just the specific, you know, they're using a lot of circle practices. But I do think there is an issue uh, of data and, and research to really demonstrate the effects. We know there are effects there, but we don't know always which practices are having better effect than others. And so actually one of the pieces by a group um, of researchers in Chicago uh, that are working on this, um, Haref, Keba, Miners, and Wallace are, are really trying to develop new ways to look at the diversity of practices and build on that to develop more effectiveness. They're also working on trying, this restorative justice practices are very local practices of healing that have had a lot of success in communities and um, 
and in the justice system and in schools, but also connecting it to broader efforts to shift the prison industrial complex, um, as was mentioned earlier, connecting it to these larger systemic issues um, as well. And so I, I, I definitely recommend some of their work. And they've been work we don't have it here because it's not done, but they've been working on measures that they are going to be doing across Chicago. And that's something I will definitely be keeping an eye out for. Thank you, Paul. Um, what other piece to that um, I'd like you and Monica to respond to, whether or not the book um, considers the effect of restorative practices in schools in reducing suspensions, expulsions, and arrests? Uh, as I was saying, I think there, there is, there's a little bit of data in here, and there is other data, data available. Um, but I just I think what we really and so I can't speak to all of it, but what we I think there's a real need for a more careful look at what these outcomes are. There's a lot more anecdotal evidence, um, but absolutely we see in Chicago we see schools that have had massive drops in suspensions, which makes sense because they are actively trying to create um, an alternative method for for dealing with these. And I think one of the issues is that there are often limits on what schools can do. Schools don't always have the, um, the flexibility to, to deal with it. I think, you know, they're really fighting against a cultural trend towards zero tolerance policies and, um, and sort of related uh, kind of punitive uh, police and justice-based policies that really have tied the hands of a lot of schools. So we've got some really great data from schools that have managed to pull it off, but a lot of schools really struggle. Maybe they can only do it for small offenses and not for, not for larger ones. Everything that I've seen is very promising, but we definitely need, need some more. I think people, uh, some people in the chat are bringing up uh, reports that, that are helpful. Right, the uh, cradle to prison pipeline um, has some good information. There's also a recent publication put out um, by rethinking schools that have some great pieces in it. So, you know, we are seeing an increase in, in publication um, very recently and a lot of good things to get a hold of. Paul, here's a, a great question that's come in from uh, one of our attendees today. He asked that a lot of the information has been on point, but what he would really like to hear more about is how the pipeline has been before youth going to prison um, has actually been formed. Were you able to get some great information from your book around that question? Um, this is Monica, and I, I think that there were um, there were several pieces. Actually, our first section of the book, uh, there were there was a piece written by a teacher actually in the New York City Public Schools, talking about his experience as a first year teacher and how similar similarities he found to uh, a, a biography of a prison guard. And so one of the things that we uh, focused on in the first part of the book was the ways in which schools are actually becoming more prison-like uh, in their surveillance of students, uh, in their treatment of uh, students, and their limiting of student freedom and student choice. Um, we have a piece in the book that's about universal design for learning. And universal de design for learning really focuses on this. Uh, one of the core concepts is really around the idea of engagement. And one of the concerns that we have both in traditional uh, local public schools and in juvenile uh, education centers is just the low level of academic rigor, academic engagement, and really opportunities for kids to find meaning in their learning. And we certainly saw that as well in the narratives that we collected from uh, young incarcerated uh, young adults um, talking about feeling as if they didn't have a teacher who cared about them, feeling as if uh, the work that they were doing didn't matter, didn't challenge them, and that really the first opportunity that they had to learn from a teacher who they felt connected with was uh, in a juvenile detention center. And so I think that, uh, you know, we know, so, so that when we say, you know, school to prison pipeline, we, we are acknowledging that, uh, especially in our urban and rural schools, a low quality uh, of instructional practice is contributing to students' disengagement, uh, students, uh, you know, possibly uh, dropping out or spending less time in uh, in school than they than they might be, and um, you know, as well as I think some of the some of the uh, amazing personal things that Starsha talked about. So. 
students outside of school are dealing with incredibly, incredibly challenging circumstances. And in a lot of ways, we expect school to be the panacea for all of those things. So to solve homelessness and poverty and drug addiction and, uh, and chronic poverty, I think is very unrealistic for us to expect schools to be able to do all of those things for, uh, for children. And so I think that uh, it, it's, it's, we never wanted to suggest that it's just one thing that's causing uh, students to leave school and become incarcerated. We, we know that it's a lot of different factors that contribute to this and that there needs to be work done on all levels, really, that everybody needs to be thinking about their level and how they can do work on their particular level to re-engage students in school, to uh, address the needs of children outside of school and in communities. And I think that's uh, hopefully one of the perspectives that we're able to convey through the book. Thank you for that. Here's one other question um, for you all. Someone wants to know specifically if you're working with the Children's Defense Fund in New York City. And if so, how? Uh, we, are, we are not, actually. We did not. Well, we were able to connect with a lot, uh, some fabulous people for the book, but that was not a connection we were able to make. So that would have been uh, excellent as well. OK. I'm, not, I'm saying five minutes till 4 PM. Um, do we have any parting comments from Monica or Paul in reference to the book and anything uh, key that you would like to share with your audience? Um, oh, one other thing before you answer that. Do any, do any articles talk about how to engage parents to encourage their children in terms of education? Um, Again, do any of the articles... Go ahead. Yeah, no, I, I appreciate that question. Both Monica and I work uh, in the realm uh, here, here at the Graduate School of Education at the realm of parent and community engagement. And I think um, that's not something that we happen to have uh, as much of in here, but that is absolutely key to, uh, to solving this problem as well as other issues uh, that schools have. But I think, you know, I think we, there's a lot of uh, sort of talk about engaging parents um, in schools, and there's a lot of difficulty in figuring out how to truly do that in practice. Um, and so I think it, by connecting teachers and parents, um, by moving from a paradigm of teachers who reach out to parents when the kids get in trouble and moving to a paradigm of partnership where teachers and parents build relationships and uh, where parents build relationships with one another is, uh, is central to a number of things that can, can affect the pipeline. So one is really trying to create school, as Monica talked about, trying to create schools that are culturally relevant to young people and connected with the real issues that they are dealing with. We absolutely have to create that link between schools um, and families. I think and there's obviously tons of research that uh, that when parents are more engaged uh, in their ch child directly in their child's education, they're more likely to persist uh, to uh, uh, succeed and to go on to college and career. Um, but we also know from the research that uh, we, that currently there's a lot of barriers to engaging parents on the school side and that schools need to do a whole lot to be, become more welcoming and open to parents as opposed to being closed off and pushing them away. So there's a whole uh, world of effort on that and you know it's intriguing to ask it in this uh, context because I haven't seen as much about parent engagement specifically connected to the pipeline. Um, I wanted to address awesome. one. I wanted to address one other Please question proceed, Paul. before we go. Someone asked earlier, sort of, what can we do? What can each of us do to connect the pipeline? And I think what we've learned more than anything in going through this uh, and building this community of authors to address this issue is how diverse the pipeline is. So the concept of the pipeline, the metaphor of the pipeline, is helpful in gathering together all of these different trends and issues. But we do need to remember that they're separate and that they're, to some extent, that there are multiple things happening and multiple ways of accessing them. So, um, you know, as we've talked about here, there's a, re there's a role for educators, both in schools and in detention centers, to create uh, culturally relevant curriculum and human, human real, authentic relationships. Um, you know, speaking earlier about uh, the gateways for incarcerated youth, these re building relationships between young people who are incarcerated and young people who are in uh, 
who are in college, like these kind of relationships are key. There's also a real need for, for, for lawyers and people to get these cases in because there are rights on the books of young people, who are young incarcerated people. Uh, they have rights to a quality education that many of them are not receiving. I think we talked about a cultural aspect of this. Part of the problem here is, is these deficit views and these narratives of young people, uh, uh, young low-income youth and youth of color that as, as dangerous and something to be protected from. We need to shift that. There's a role for artists and documentary makers and writers and just youth themselves and telling their stories. Um, and there is a political face to all of this. And I think that we need to address the issues of power, of who has power in making these decisions um, by by organizing young people, by having young people and communities and parents uh, organized to lead the way in helping us understand uh, what this is and where we get things wrong and what and what needs to change. So I just feel like there's all of us have a role to play and there's so many different roles. Those uh, people who are working in the justice system and, to, and people who are working at the policy level, um, there's just a lot of there's a lot of entryways which I think is very promising and we need people at all of them. Thank you so much, Monica and Paul. Hats off to both of you all for sitting in today and answering questions about disrupting the school to prison pipeline. Yasmin has left, but Sarcia as well as Naomi, hats off to both of you. Uh, thank you so much. Please go to the chat box and let people know how they can reach you personally. Please feel free to chat up your email address and your contact information. For those of us that you that are still with us, and that's 122 of you strong, Please take five minutes before you go anywhere to share this information and complete the online evaluation, which will be accessible to you um, now, actually. And if you cannot access it here, you certainly can add this, um, the link to your web browser and answer that and uh, respond that way. Please know that in about 14 business days, this will be recorded and accessible for you to pay it forward on the OJJDP Training Center. You can access that by going to www.intact.org and clicking on the OJJDP Training Center tab. Again, please stay with us to complete the five-minute evaluation. And um, if you look now, you will see the email addresses for the presentation panel. Again, thanks to our presentation panel as well as OJJDP for hosting um, this presentation today. I'd also like to thank Paul and Monica for participating. It was wonderful to have you on. I so much appreciate your time. And um, thank you to all of you who participated today. Thanks so much.